Hello and welcome to News Click. I am Paranjay Guha Thakurta. On the 1st of July 2023, I was honored and privileged to interview India's greatest living filmmaker, Sham Benegal. I spoke to him for almost two hours at his office in Tardeo in Mumbai. In the first part of this interview, we discussed his forthcoming film on Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. It's titled Mujib, The Making of a Nation and scheduled to be released towards the end of 2023. In this, the second part of this interview, we discuss his famous trilogy of films made on Muslim women. We also discuss politics. We discuss the Muslim question in Narendra Modi's India. I ask him questions about minority com communalism, majority communalism, and Shambhanigal is somewhat ambivalent in condemning the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh and he's non-committal, he's non-committal about commenting on India's present Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Let me specifically ask you, Sham Benegal ji, two vekti ke upar, jin dono ke baare mein aapne films banaye hain. Ek Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Aaj hum Bharat Sarkar se Bharat Sarkar ne jo aaj Bharatiya Janata Party ka samarthak hai, jo Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh ka samarthak hai, aaj har mauke mein Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru ko jo chavi kharaab karne ke liye Aage bar rahe, aur kar bhi rahe. The image of India's first Prime Minister is being sought to be tainted and even tarnished by large sections of people who claim to be supporters of the Bharati Janta Party and the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. What do you have to say about this? Well, clearly, you know, you can't wipe out history. How can you take away the fact that you had India's first Prime Minister, probably who was the Prime Minister the longest in, in our country. Wow. Now, the fact is that he laid the foundation for the country. Look at the five-year plans. Not all of them were successful, but the fact was that it, it, it made, he, he laid the first brick as far as development, processes of development in India were concerned. No, a lot of the present day um, political establishment does not give him credit for that. But the fact is that he did. You see, the, his five-year plans, the first five-year plan and then the second five-year plan, of course, he, it couldn't be completed or it was done, but there were wars in between, you know, we had a war in 1965, we had a war in 1971, but he was there when the 1965 war took place. So, you see, the problem is that you have a situation which has, uh, uh, a, where he set, I mean, without him, you cannot think of a modern India. You know, you can't really, at least to me, for myself, I don't think you can think of a modern India without the foundational work that was done by that generation. Among them, Jawaharlal Nehru played an important part. But there Shams were other people like Sardar sure, Patel sure. and various other people who were, in fact, maybe more important. No, today there are large sections of the ruling establishment, the ruling regime, who try to portray Nehru Banam Sardar Patel. And a concerted effort is being made to portray Jawaharlal Nehru in a negative light. Why is this being done? You see, the, I think that's being uh, unfair to both. 
because you know as long as uh, sardar patel lived they were both very i mean they they worked together they may have had differences differences of opinion differences of the method that had to be used and so on and maybe sardar patel was more indulgent towards the younger man you know all these things were there but then these are the in the in the larger if you look at a if you take a historical perspective they were both equally important for independent india you know and sardar patel of course there are people who who believe that he, he his contribution was greater but then i don't want to go get, get into that kind of thing but the important thing was they worked shoulder to shoulder you know when it came to india Un unfortunately sardar patel died very quickly you know if he had lived longer maybe we would have had a slightly different uh, th history for no, ourselves yeah I, the, i repeat my question why is there such a concerted attempt to not just downgrade his contribution but to actually tarnish the image of nehru i know but the fact is that you know this is a this is an entirely i mean it's a political thing it and it's also kind of i'm not quite sure whether it is a it is a tactical thing for the opposition parties no 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 longer opposition party you mean the, the ruling, ruling party, party the ruling the party but you know because it's a, it, it, there was a certain kind of tactic used you know to to come to power as well and so people who went before you you tend to discredit them no this is a ten tendency for most politicians to do that it's nothing unusual in that you don't think it's anything unusual tell me when you look at the changes that are being made to the history textbooks across the country there is simultaneously a section of people who claim they owe allegiance to the rss the rashtriya swayamsevak sangh to the bharatiya janata party to prime minister narendra modi to glorify and defy gandhi ji's assassin nathuram godse you see rss and his mentors and his mentors including sawalkar yeah but the fact is that you see rss never claimed to be a political party or political i mean the ideology had a political ideology except that of you know the uh, allegiance to the land you know to the land of your birth and where you're living so rss in that sense you know it was a it was a kind of a, uh, because when it came the british were still here you know so they were they were claiming their bit of land as theirs but the important thing here was that there were several others i mean you had different kinds of uh, political views on this as far as rss was concerned it was it, it was based entirely on uh, principles that are basically hindu in that sense you know but then then they defined hinduism as hindu be that people who lived in india because it was hindustan and they were hindus anyway some you know and it, it was the it was the definition of their religion you know it was the definition of their uh, status as indians being hindus now it was totally accepted by a whole lot of other people certainly not by minorities in this country hinduism and hindutva more importantly yeah i repeat the question why is there an attempt made by sections of people to glorify gandhi's assassin and well, his mentors including savarkar well that i i don't think i can answer that question because you know what the what the uh, thing was i mean what the strategy was 
political strategy in wanting to do something like this because I, I, I cannot see the thing, but except that I know that uh, he, he say, RSS claimed to be Indian, but it was Hindu because they, they considered that everybody living in India were Hindus, you know. And, they, and then, of course, there was the, 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 the said that there was no caste system. You know, there was no caste. There was no such thing as a minority, you know. But, do, but do, do you agree with that viewpoint? No, I don't agree with that because, you know, the fact is that I, I, I believe that our unity is a, is a very unique thing as far as India is concerned. Our unity lies in its diversity because we are not a country like a European country. You know, there's something, the, the single language, single religion. Europe has defined their nation in those terms. But we have always defined our nation as a kind of, you know, unity and diversity. That nobody disagrees with. Ab, ab, ek sawal ka jawab स्वाधीनता के लिए जो हम लोग जो संग्राम किया हमारे पिताजी और उनका पिता the freedom struggle इसमें आरएसएस का कोई भूमिका था या नहीं ये अत्यंत आज एक विवादित एक कंट्रोवर्शियल एक विषय हो गया और चर्चा चल रहा है और जैसे मैंने पहले बताया आपको बच्चों के लिए जो स्कूल में जो पढ़ते हैं जो किताब कभी Dobara log likrahe wo kitab. RSS, as you know, had never claimed to be a political party. It Social organization. No, it ne it because it was never defined as such. And they saw themselves as a cultural organization. And it was a certain amount of cultural revivalism there. You know, the, the whole idea that is cultural revivalism but there it depends on who is defining that, you know. It depends on from which, which part of the spectrum you are, and you will define it differently. But the, the, but the important thing, of course, is that they were also a force for the good, as far as independent India was concerned. One minute. So you believe that the RSS had a role to play? But the, there is a controversy today that the RSS did not support the freedom movement, but sided often with the British. Well, I don't know. That's probably stretching it a bit too far. Because, you know, they didn't, they didn't think that it was important, that they need to support, you know, the, support the, the allies, as it were, during the war, and all this kind of thing, or any such thing. They, because they define themselves as a cultural organization, not as a political organization. Let me ask you that. The Bharatiya Jan Sangh was born. RSS is going to be 100 years old in 2025, if I'm not mistaken. The BJ, the Bharatiya Jan Sangh is much younger. But the role of those who subscribe to their ideology the Hindutva ideology, do you think they had a role to play in India's freedom movement? Well, you know, there, there's a, it depends on how you look at it, really, because they didn't, it wasn't like the Congress. You know, the Congress had a very distinct anti-British stance. You know, a whole lot of other parties also did. Socialist meaning uh, uh, that is the so Congress Socialist Party also did. But then you had at the same time, you had people who had supported the British during the war. You know, who, that is you had, uh, Savarkar was clearly, you know, for, for uh, against the British. Not only was he But he wrote the, an apology. No, but he, he, he later, because once he was condemned into, a, into jail, when he was put in jail for a lifetime, then he, he, 
uh, repudiated many of the things that he had earlier said so that in order to get, get his freedom, he came out of jail. But the fact was that that didn't make him any less a nationalist. You know, that, because his, his stance was, of course, he came out of jail because when he was there in uh, Andamans, he, he said that, you know... So, so you're saying he wrote the series of letters of apology to the British rulers to get out of jail? No, there were letters of apology which he had written. There's no question about that. But the fact was that he, they, they saw it as a tactic. Let me ask you something related today. And I'm talking about today's India. And you have examined not just the way caste works, the way class works, politics of sex works, but we'll talk about that in a little while from now. You made three films which are often described as your Muslim women's trilogy. And these were three films, Mamo, 1994, Farida Jalal, Surekha Sikri, it deals with the partition, it deals with Pakistan and India, it deals with Mumbai, how she starts living in Mumbai, how she has to pay bribes to get a, a permanent visa, how she's arrested, sent back to Pakistan. And you've shown how political priorities often triumph humanitarian considerations. And it's told through uh, the sister, uh, Farida Jalal, the character played by Farida Jalal, her, she's a sister, uh, her older sister's son. This is 1994. 1996, Sardari Begum. Musical, Kiran Khair, she's a member of the ruling party, Amrish Puri, who's no more. It deals with family relationships, generational relationships, sexual politics. But once again, there is a political angle in the sense the stone which is thrown, the riot that takes place in Old Delhi. Less political is Zubeda, of course, loosely based on the life of the mother of film critic Khalid Mohammed, starring Karishma Kapoor and Rekha. Uh, now, what we see, the, the, it's called Zubeda's a story of a princess. And she marries an already married man who's married to the character played by Rekha, Manoj Bajpayee's character. And then her brother-in-law makes advances at her. But eventually both the Maharaja and Zubeda die in the plane crash. And you suggest that it was really a conspiracy for Uday Singh, the younger brother, to get hold of the kingdom. It is perhaps less political than the two other films. But all the three films talk about the condition of Muslims in India. Today, many could argue that Islamophobia is at a level that prevailed in the 40s. When the subcontinent was partitioned, when Bengal and Punjab were partitioned. And today, many people say that अगर आप भारतवर्ष में मुसलमान हैं, तो आप सेकंड क्लास नागरिक हैं या यू आर अ सेकंड क्लास सिटिजन? आपने देखा क्या हुआ सिटिजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट, नेशनल रजिस्टर ऑफ सिटिजन्स, तो एक तरह से द प्रेजेंट रूलिंग एस्टैबलिशमेंट, द भारतीय जनता पार्टी एंड इट्स आइडियोलॉजिकल पेरेंट, द believers in a majoritarian ideology. As a person who's examined through your films, Muslim women, what are your views on how Islamophobia has spread in India today? Where one seventh, one out of seven Indians who are Muslim, how they feel in today's India? in the last nine years that Narendra Modi has been in power. There are more Muslims in India 
in all countries in the world except for Indonesia and perhaps Pakistan as well. But the Muslims in this country, one seventh of India, do feel that they are beleaguered, that they are being treated as second class citizens. Large sections of the media have contributed to the spread of Islamophobia. And barring a few token individuals, the Bharatiya Janata Party, not a single member of parliament is a Muslim who is to the Lok Sabha. There are two things here. One, the most important thing is that we, we, the country got, India got partitioned on the basis that you, they, you had to have, because of the population ratios and so on and so forth, Jinnah brought about the two nation theory. Now that two nation theory became actually a fact. But the odd part of it was that, you know, the, uh, India is not sort of clearly between Muslims and Hindus or Hindus and other minorities and Muslims on one side. It, ha it has never been like that. But the fact was that if you are going to make a nation, create a nation, then you, ho you have to have that kind of division made. Now, which they made, which caused horrors all over the place. I mean, the, and vast uh, movements of populations, you know, in 1947, 48. And then even later, you know, when you had, uh, when you had sort of Pakistan split itself into two. But the important thing was that when, when the first partition took place between India and Pakistan, at that time, you had, you know, in people's minds that we constantly claim to be secular. You know, we, that is India, claim to be secular. We created a constitution that we, got, you know, made it important that our secularism was very important to us. But the funny part of it was that because it was a Hindu majority country, you know, India being a Hindu majority country, there was always a tendency for minorities to feel that they didn't really have a kind of place here as they should have. You know, Pakistan was fine because they did, it, it, it was already divided into, and it could claim itself, I mean, could make the claim of being Islamic, and Islamic Republic also. But even that got a, a you know, it, it, it got a hit when, when Pakistan itself split. You know, so, the, he was, the, because this is still part of the continuing historical dialogue in this country, you know, because we, if, and we constantly have the, different kinds of problems, you know, people claiming this, people claiming that, all, the, all sorts of things. But the important thing is that you can keep claiming if you want, you can always evolve, the, the whole process becomes, as long as it doesn't become a tinderbox. But tell me, has Islamophobia in India again peaked and we have in some ways regressed, gone back 80 years to the 40s? Well, you know, it, it, you, we can use the word, but I don't think I would use the word Islamophobia so easily because, you know, we have, for instance, uh, if you look at a, a place like Hyderabad, Hyderabad, with the Nizam state of Hyderabad. Now, when the, it was a Nizam state of Hyderabad, it, it had four languages, you know. It had Urdu, it had uh, Telugu, it had Kannada, and of course it, it had English, because English was the language through which all higher education was uh, taught, you know. So you had these were the languages. But then the moment we developed a concept that the language will determine the nation. So a language is one of the important components of a nation. 
then this this whole uh, hyderabad thing was collapsed sham medical ji main dobara sawal aap se pooch raha hu ye aaj bharatvarsh mein pichle 9 saal mein भारतीय जनता पार्टी एक भी मुसलमान प्रार्थी लोकसभा चुनाव में नहीं रखा आप देखिए 2019 लोकसभा चुनाव के बाद पांच लोकसभा सांसद में 303 भारतीय जनता पार्टी के एक भी मुसलमान नहीं है वन सेवेंथ ऑफ इंडिया इज नॉट रिप्रेजेंटेड इन द लोअर हाउस ऑफ पार्लियामेंट इन द रूलिंग पार्टी सो वट डू यू हैव टू से दैट द भारतीय जनता पार्टी विच क्लेम्स दैट द इट्स द इट इज द इट्स आइडियोलॉजिकल पेरेंट द सोशल एंड कल्चरल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन कॉल द आर एस एस द राष्ट्रीय स्वयं सेवक संघ दैट इट हैज शोन this is their attitude towards 1/7 of india 200 million muslims what do you have to say you know about uh, muslim representation in parliament or <coughs> in parliament or in parties <coughs> i don't really believe that's that's all that important <coughs> quite frankly because you don't necessarily have to be represented by your religion by your claim of being one or another religion if we, we if we claim to be a democracy we shouldn't worry about these things why should we worry about that because according to me as long as there are equal opportunities you know equal opportunities when it comes to work equal opportunities when it comes to education is that happening in india well i think it is happening but it's happening very fairly slowly but but in india we also had another thing we had for instance schools that catered to muslims you know so you had uh, uh, but slowly that changed for instance in, you know i come from hyderabad and in hyderabad we had for instance my school my the school that i went to it was called mahbub college high school now the fact was that when it was originally started it wasn't seen as a school for everybody it was it was a, seen as a school that would be that would bring up the muslim population you know the quality of education for them since they were they 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 were all you know madrasa people so they didn't have modern education now the fact was that when you started the school like this nizam started a school like this that my boys high school like nizam college was there and it was i mean the original language in which you were given education was in urdu but it changed नहीं मैं आज का भारतवर्ष के बारे में आपसे सवाल उठा रहा हूं किसके बारे में टू डेज इंडिया आज का भारतवर्ष डू यू बिलीव दैट मुस्लिम फील दैट दे हैवीन ट्रीटेड एज सेकेंड क्लास सिटीजन आई एम नॉट क्वाइट श्योर दैट इज एंटायरली ट्रू बिकॉज इट आई डोंट बिलीव दैट इफ यू इफ यू वेंट टू अ प्लेस वेर देर हैज बिन अ ग्रेट अमाउंट ऑफ यू नो लाइक the old mysore state that is karnataka hyderabad that is uh, andhra pradesh but mainly now telangana the, the telangana part now i don't believe that this this holds good for them i don't but, think but, but what they, about northern india what about uttar pradesh well there you see which has been affected those parts of the country that were affected by partition that feeling is much greater there no that's bengal and punjab largely but yeah. i'm talking about uttar pradesh yeah. i'm talking about madhya pradesh chatisgarh rajasthan there is a feeling muslims do feel that they are being treated as second class citizens do you agree and this feeling has grown in the last 9 years of the narendra modi regime would you agree with me 
I, you know, I don't know enough about uh, uh, northern India in that sense, because to make a, any kind of broad comment on that, you know, because it's very difficult for me to say that. Because you see, when I go to, when I'm traveling, it doesn't seem like uh, there's any problem there. You know, it's, 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 it, but then that is very, so, in so, some so, ways, it's quite superficial. See what happened in Gujarat in 2002. Oh, Gujarat is uh, so, so See what know, happened in Gujarat. Delhi. So, so see <coughs> what happened in Delhi very no, recently. No, Gujarat, Gujarat has a certain, uh, because you had Muslim majority parts, you know, because there was a Nawab, there was a, you know, the, uh, what was his name? I, the fellow who went off. Junagar. Junagar. Now, Junagar had a, a, a Muslim majority but, but, at but, one time. But today's Gujarat, the proportion of the population that is Muslim is half of that of the rest of the country. Rest of India, as per the 2011 census, is around 14%. So you don't want to comment on, you don't believe there is Islamophobia has reached a level comparable to the 40s? Well, it comes up from time to time because we do have riots, we have different kinds of things like that. But I don't believe that it is a threat to our country in that sense. There is a certain amount of Islamophobia, certainly there is. Just as much as there is a, a kind of prejudice among Muslims, you know, no, these but, things show, show themselves much more easily in things like marriages and stuff like that. What kind of communalism would you condemn more? The, communal, the communalism of the majority community or the but, communalism of the minority community? See, jo, jo, jo minority communalism is not that dangerous. As majority majoritarian, uh, you know, communalism that is worse because they have much greater influence. See, my, minority communalism is, of course, is, communalism generally is bad in a secular country, but the fact is that minority communalism is something that can be kept held together. But the majority, majority in communalism is really dangerous to all minorities. Do you think we are going through such a stage like that in India at present? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because I think uh, we, we, it's, a, it's not, there's no, it's, it's not a simple uh, between two uh, groups. It's not just Hindus and Muslims. Because we have people from different, uh, Faith, I mean, you have Christians, you have this, you but, have... But, but look, but no, you the have... last time we had a census in this country was in 2011. We haven't won, had one in 2021, okay? But that census shows that roughly 80%, little more than 80% of the population is Hindu. 14% well, is Muslim and the rest are the other communities. Yeah, of course. Are, but then, you know, I don't know how that is a threat to our, uh, you know, how our unity is affected by that. I don't believe so. Because, you know, there was a time, for instance, Northeast, when it was on, on the boil. It is still, Manipur yeah. is on the boil. Ma Manipur, yes. But just now, it's, but it's not, you know, the whole, the whole <clears throat> Manipur is one, but the whole Nifa part. Arunachal Pradesh, yeah. Northeastern Frontier Agency. Okay. Uh, Shambhinagar ji, you know, you have received several awards. You've got 18 National Film Awards. You were given the, uh, in 2005, the Dada Sai Falke Award, India's highest award for filmmakers. In 1976, you got the Padma Shri. In 1991, uh, you got the Padma Bhushan. You've served on the juries of several film festivals in India and across the world, including in 2009 at the Moscow International Film Festival. At the same time, your films indicate that you're not really pro-establishment. In more ways than one, you have been a beneficiary of the establishment, and yet you've been a critique 
and a critic, often a strident critic of the establishment. And I'm, I'm looking at all the films that you made and, uh, you know, including the most recent one just before Mr. Narendra Modi came to power uh, in 2014, the one on the Indian constitution, Samvidhan, Rajya Sabha television, March 2014. You made films uh, on the occasion of the uh, Golden Jubilee of India's independence, Sankranti. Of course, Bharat Ek Hoj was there. At the same time, you, you work with the government, you criticize the government. No, because you see, I, <clears throat> I personally believe <clears throat> that India has to be democratic. You know, because the diversity points to that direction. All right. right. That is number one. Number two, you have to look at the flaws. You know, you must pinpoint the flaws in your system. As a, therefore, you, as a as a filmmaker, or as, a, as a, you, you normally look at your society in a particular way, and therefore, you also look at the flaws that exist. You know, to, to pinpoint those flaws is is one of the things you can do through cinema, like which I have been doing over a long period of time. You know, it does not mean that I'm against the system, but I'm really very concerned about the flaws in our system, you know, which, which, which need to be pinpointed from time to time. So do you feel in the last nine years that Narendra Modi has been the Prime Minister of India, Democracy has become stronger in India or weaker in India? I'm not quite sure. You see, but it's, it's still uh, uh, the jury is out on that one. Because, you know, it's, it's very difficult to tell. But one of the things, of course, is that there has been a certain amount of... Uh, uh, he, he, the, it has been possible for a certain kind of development to take place. Because... The, then the, much of the uh, uh, dissatisfaction has been contained. You know, has I'm, not, been contained. I'm not able to understand Up to you. a point, it has been contained, except in the Northeast and places like that. By and large, of course, but you have to accept that. But the fact is what that... About, what about Gujarat 2002? What about... Delhi, Delhi, as recently as 2019, what do you say to that? You've seen communal riots, Hindu-Muslim riots. You see it even now as we are talking in the state where you are and where we are sitting in Maharashtra. It's not as if Hindu-Muslim tensions in the country have come down. There is, on the contrary, there is evidence that, no, it's not. It, that, that, not it has that gone it, up. It, I'm saying that it, it, it is being, or rather, we know how to contain it. We have known how to contain it. Because, you see, if you look back from the time of partition, you, you see that... No, the question is, was it contained in Gujarat in 2002? Was it contained... In, in uh, Delhi, almost two decades later, northeastern Delhi, was it contained? Or, or was it the establishment was complicit with the rioters and they belonged to the majority community, the Hindus? I, I really wouldn't know. I mean, mm -hmm. I... It's okay. A, yeah. I mean, I'll stop all my questions on politics, but I have one last question. How do you evaluate Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister? How did I? Evaluate Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister of India in the last nine years. Well, you know, I, he, he, the, the fact is that he has, he has not cur curtailed democracy in that sense. You know, the democratic norms have not been constantly tampered with. That he has not done. I would disagree with you, but 
Yeah. You are entitled to your opinion. Yeah. I believe whether it's the media, whether it's the civil service, whether it's uh, uh, law enforcing agencies, whether it's been constitutional authorities, all these organizations have, which are supposed to provide checks and balances in a democracy, in my opinion, it's become weaker in the last nine years. Would you agree with me? Well, I cannot comment on that really. Okay. We conclude the second segment of this interview with Sham Benegal, India's greatest living filmmaker. In this segment, we've discussed politics and I keep questioning him. I have questioned him again and again on his views on majoritarianism. He's clear. The communalism of the majority Hindu community is to be condemned more than the communalism of the minority Muslim community. Yet, he is ambivalent about the role of leaders of the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, in India's freedom movement. And he's also non-committal about Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Wait for the third part of this interview. Sham Benegal reminiscences about several individuals. Actors he made, actors like Smita Patil, Om Puri, Amrish Puri. He reminiscences about the films he's made, about the documentary films he made on Satyajit Rai. That will all happen in the third and final segment of this interview. Till then, keep watching News Click, subscribe to this channel.